out of into the mid game, into the late game, which doesn't seem to function for this team at the minute. What's interesting to me, though, and I'm going to be I'm going to call you two out a little bit because you just brought up a lot of names that are relevant players and doing well or poorly in this situation. But you haven't said the big name that I feel like all eyes should be on coming onto this. And maybe this is a bit of host bias. I'll admit it. But I think if there's a certain AD carry who should be adding Manduka in front of their name right now, because not only are they playing sweet, but they're playing strong as well. I'm, of course, speaking of Honey, who has I just mean, been on an absolute tear. And I feel like realistically for access, wouldn't a lot of their success also be falling back on this player individually? I mean, absolutely. I've been, I'm just holding up my cup of tea here and thinking, you know what, we really make it better, just a little bit more honey. And that's exactly <laughs> how Axis have been this split to get away from that horrible analogy very quickly. Um, <laughs> this was a guy who came in last year, complete rookie, onto the Hawks, who had a roster of people like Dasher and Tussle and Ramane, all of these big names at the time. And obviously, some of those players have fallen off a little bit since that time, unfortunately. But never really managed to make it work then this split with a year under his belt honey has come alive he was a solo queue monster that was brought in uh, and this split in particular he can do no wrong his stats across the board are insane i believe he's top 10 in the world for dps numbers as well uh, which is kind of impressive i mean obviously that's including some players who've only played one or two games so it's not like, who you know, mm. you come in for a couple of games, have a great series, you know, you get those good stats and, you know, that can inflate things. But no, he has been absolutely phenomenal, particularly on the jinx, though. And that's the one thing that does worry me. It's like, OK, can you do this consistently for Axis if the jinx is taken away from you? I, I do feel like, oh, you go ahead, sorry. Oh, so you can emulate that late game hyper carry style. We are seeing a small drift away from it in the meta. So that international sort of doom of the LJL of not quite getting maybe where they want to uh, is maybe looming in the distance, especially with China's deep understanding of the bot lane. You mentioned that DPM. Some of the Chinese AD carries have been doing yeah. ridiculous oh, things. I want to talk about it. Honey's, <laughs> but it's so impressive. No, 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 honey, not listening. honey is still on the fine. board. <laughs> Still in the top 10 with all of the things that have happened in the LPL this split. It's so impressive. But we, yeah, we do it, maybe have to temper this. I want to see, like, I saw Ezreal last week from Honey, and that looked, that looked pretty good. So more things, more fun for this uh, well, Axis side. Yeah, and that kind of gets me what I'm trying to get in here is because, mm, like, ah. you look at this top 10 in the world. You look at, you know, maybe the narrow champion pool. I agree. You start to expand that champion pool, and all of a sudden... Going back to that M word before, before I was talking about Manuka, <laughs> perhaps it goes for most, as in most valuable player, because that could be in the consideration if this level of play continues. However, coming into this matchup, though, you would think with the trajectory of each of these teams, Axis would be that team to watch. So we're actually going to have to cut this discussion short and get into it. Picks and bans now underway. So I'm going to leave you two guys to it. Very curious to see what Honey picks up. Very curious to see how this game plays out. Uh, have a good one. I'll see you all at the end of the game. Please take us away. Thank you so much, Formal. Absolute pleasure having you take us through that. Indeed, we are into picks and bans. I'm actually here with Temporal. He's managed to make it to cast. It's been mm -hmm. a hot minute, mate. Before we talk about ourselves, we perhaps got to talk about this pick and ban. Axis on the blue side, Sengoku on the red. Fiego Jinx from <laughs> Sengoku. <laughs> LeBlanc, Gwen, and finally Rise now out by Axis. Just taking away some of Ramane's bigger, more agency heavy picks, which is something he's been struggling to make work for Sengoku alongside mm. the Gwen. One final ban for Sengoku now to, to round out their first bans. So before we get on to that, Jinx, because I'm pretty sure that is the only time in the history of League of Legends Red Side has said Viego Jinx as first two, uh, <laughs> which is kind of incredible. Um, Axes <laughs> have, you, you've hit on Ramane struggling here. Rise, there is a current huge discussion. This champion's stats are like in the bin. He's really underperforming in solo queue. The champion is not set together, but in competitive play ah, with the Faker, best mid laners yes. in the world, with <laughs> Faker, with Ramune, this champion still shines. It is another Rise impossible balance. So look for that sixth rework in the future oh, um, as that. his current kit has stabilized something that should be impossible where it's unplayable in many situations, but still the best in the world. Just to steal victories with the blue man. And uh, Ramane will be struggling once again. Axes, now this could be exciting. More things from Honey, potentially. The Ziggs that Indeed. has rocked 11-14 is the blue one pick. Flexible, 
between middle and bottom. Will this be honey on a mage? We were playing it in 1113 even, so, you know, it's mm. not something that's entirely new to the LJL, and I can guarantee that's being true in scrims as well. Sengoku responded, of course, with the Diana, which has been one of those high priority jungles. Yes, it's a little bit lower in 1114, but still pretty goddamn strong, to be blunt. Oh, yes. Lock that in alongside the Renekton, which is strictly a flex, but more likely going towards Paz. And at least most likely the bottom side of the map with a bit more counter pick, which has definitely been Sengoku's modus operandi. Response here, though, from Max is looking like potentially the Leona to add in a, a little bit more solar flare to go with your Mega Inferno bomb. What? Assuming, of course, Ziggs goes bomb. Oh, yes. So, so Leona is a fantastic lane. Ziggs normally support Ignorant, but the more tools you give that little Yordle in the bot lane, the more his bombs matter. And a bit of extra magic damage coming through from the Leona passive and Leona being quite self-serving in lane with that uh, solar eclipse. Keep it nice and healthy. Uh, and pump those resistances means that uh, you go that little bit further. That's another B3 uh, B3 Olaf. I believe okay. Axis did this last week. They may have done. It's also a Hoglet special. Even when Axis has been struggling in the past, Hoglet on the Olaf has been a go-to for this guy. Back, of course, when Yumi was a bit more of a thing as well. Mm -hmm. That was something he would go to. Being right now, in fact, by Sengoku, which uh, is <laughs> kind of funny. I don't, I don't think it's one of those ones where, like, I oh, don't think there's any in. way of access actually locking it in. And Sengoku don't just hover it, they just lock it straight in for NT. Never mind saving support counter pick. Well, I suppose it still strictly is support counter pick, but never mind leaving it till late. They'll just lock it in right now. Crikey. Um, that's really <laughs> that's that, 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 that's something. <laughs> that's something because the uh, so, so I was really impressed because I've watched a few Axis games because my deep, my more historical knowledge of the LGL applies to teams like DFM, Sengoku really well, oh, but yeah. for Axis, it really doesn't apply right now. So I was like, well, I have to, I gotta learn something real quick, uh, otherwise, I'm gonna look like a spanner when I come on because I've missed a few weeks of uh, VODs. Um, I was really impressed with Hoglet's conditional frontline management. When mm. axes don't have like like two tanks is rare in League of Legends right now. That that's just the way things are. Yeah. But when that one tank you have mm -hmm. offers so much threat and yet still survives, it manages to contribute so meaningfully. That is uh, a huge boon to a player. That is something we look for. Something that looks fantastic. And Hoglet on this Olaf offers that much. This pick of the Yumi. I, I'm really interested to see what Sengaku are hovering here. They've eaten two bands that transfer really well with the Yumi. It makes you pretty vulnerable in the second stage because Yumi can only do so many things. So the Twitch taken away will not be able to try and blow open Ziggs in the bottom lane. And Lucian probably for the middle. That means Axis agreeing with you here, initialize that Rennington likely for the top side. Most likely. I mean, the Twitch ban, as you called out, raised my eyebrow a little bit there, but you see how it's supposed to pair up with the Yumi. They lock instead with the Sivir very defensive bot lane with an interesting map with a fair amount of wave clear but the moment you hit level six you both press r and you can run pretty much anybody down with that i think the only person you could even think to stand against that would be interestingly olaf who is of course quite capable of running through all that cc and uh matching silver blow for blow on that one uh debating a lee sin lock here in response to axis and they oh. will do so that probably means Elisa in solo lane, which has been the want of most players around the world, even if it has been the occasional jungler for it. Um, one final pick to lock in. Could either be mid or top. You could be mid or top here. Uh, Lee Sin has an okay Rennington matchup and offers a lot of things to his team that Rennington also offers, like that team fight setup. Instead, looks like we might be seeing the Gangplank, another champion that's in the balance team's discussion rounds at the moment as he uh, has transformed over the years with not a lot done to him. Now, just that lane bully in the early lane. Uh, proc grasp on cooldown, do what you do, and you'll probably scale after you build your Infinity Edge. Uh, has an okay Renekton matchup, but not the greatest in the world, and is slightly vulnerable. So we might see Paz uh, not just full click. You know what? Never mind. That Renekton's go. Ooh. I just Ooh. say, Ramade could play that mid too. Yeah. I feel like I'll do a quick double check for you. Hmm. But I feel like Ramade is been a jace player of old he but I, I i hesitate to say how well that's gone of course ramane back in the day did in fact have a, a very successful career even if it 
has been a bit tougher for him more of late. So we'll wait to see where the flexes come. We'll keep potentially like the Renekton mid and then the Jace top uh, for Paz, which again is Paz has picked it up before too. Yeah, uh, I, I think so. So the, the swaps are coming through, which is sort of, I believe, given the game away. But Jace often picked as hyper comfort into Gangplank, but also into Lee Sin, which is why I hesitated. Uh, because you, of course, take those barrels away. Your attack speed always faster than Gangplank, unless you've just traded. Um, and you uh, get priority just to take those barrels away faster than Gangplank can uh, charge them up himself. Uh, yeah. which, is, which, is, which is where I think the Jace is going, because that, that's like a, a hard limit for the Jace. But uh, both of those lanes quite open. So if things go wrong, we could see lane swaps um, to try and patch together this early game, because it, it matters a reasonable amount for the least in Renekton in uh, mid lane, especially can open up to a lot of jungle interference. And when you've got yeah, a Deanna on board, the only thing better than full clear consistently to get maximum XP into your Deanna is full clear with a with a quick drive by on that mid lane. And uh, Olaf in a similar boat, you know, reasonable amount of kill pressure for both of these junglers. So I expect to see sparks fly, especially in mid lane. Interesting as well, considering how much pressure we're putting towards these bot lanes. But we've got a Ziggs and a Sip yeah. there, two, like the biggest wave clear options out there, of course. There is the Leona, and, you know, there's no one to body block for Sivir, even if there is, of course, a spell shield. So maybe we see something down there, especially once level six is hard, start and there are a little bit more um, opportunities to make things happen. I did just do a quick double check as well for you. At least off the stats that are available, and be aware, guys, the LGL record keeping previous to about season seven and six was a little bit limited on the international level, so not lots to work off before that, but uh, I'm pretty sure Ramane wasn't even playing in the LGL at that point. I think he came in season yeah. seven, if I recall correctly, over on Rampage and the likes, but um, I hesitate to come in and call that gospel. Either way, no games from home for Jace. So, no games you know, from Jace. Uh, I mean, if in that case, in... it would have been a first pick for him. So. Well... Let, let, let's check if I've got Ramane's name confused with someone else. Previous uh, LCK or um, uh, you'll think of Nation, career? possibly. Ah, uh, got me. It would be over for CGA. Now, Ramane has been around got the LCK a little bit longer than Nation, uh, that's for sure. Um, yeah. We caught him there. Uh, as production brings him up there, and it's 25. 15 he started over on scars apparently so not quite. Uh, I, I, rampage of course in 2016 was the one where things started getting it was, and 17 was when it started getting doing well for him we started winning a little bit more but uh of course he was being has been around for quite a while here in the lgl largely to pretty good success aside from the last two years which is what's been a little bit tragic to watch you know 2019 guy comes in it, he's um brought in basically to be a dfm sub behind seros because he can play leblanc he can play zoe um valuable uh, exactly, in all areas but, but, but especially that one uh, and you know that wasn't really in saros's wheelhouse uh but he was stuck kind of just on the sub bench for most of the split didn't really get that much game time didn't really get to start even when best of fives came through and then finally gets released from substitute prison to come back onto the main stage in 2020 and just falls a bit flat <laughs> unfortunately yeah. and it's kind of been true again in in summer here, towards playoffs, we started seeing Ramane and Crash have a bit more synergy, was getting things happening, that the rise in particular was looking very scary, but uh, there's just been a lack of synergy, really, between the team mm. and Ramane, one way or another, that's been leaving the, him out to dry, either by his own or some combination of him and his team's um, synergy issues. Whereas on the mm. other side, been the exact opposite for Axis. Megamin, complete rookie. Nemo, complete rookie. Inno, complete rookie with two uh, decent-ish veterans, though I probably would rather call them journeymen, really, and Hoglet and Honey. Hoglet has got a bit more experience, but the fact this team has come together in summer and looked so dangerous is, is really exciting to see, and it's time to see whether the veteranship of Sengoku can put up or shut up, because playoffs <laughs> is looking like a fake dream, but if they want to make it happen, this is it. Axis can definitely make themselves those veterans uh, throughout the course of this split. It's uh, it's all coming together, so to speak. As uh, I, I am, I am enjoying the the like setup here. This is the proper neutral setup, the way it should oh, be done, with the jungler uh, hidden from view after watching mid, then dropping their vision and rotating it. So props to Axis. They're doing that better than some teams that get a bit lazy and just plonk their jungler in the river, which gives away some key information. Oh, they're starting on that buff. Tends to be quite yeah. helpful. 
Oh, oh. yes. Uh, starting with the chickens does help. Uh, sort of the setup as uh, I've not run into LJ Elbot before, but you that's know, a bit of a... This crank son. He's great. He offers some statistical uh, overview for what's the likelihood of teams to win any uh, uh, concerning the picks as they stand in the meta and results in the LJL, but, I believe. But, but, I can't let's, guarantee let's what goes into it. Let's crank son. That is... <laughs> Even the BAI yeah. power spike, mate. There's the very relative power spikes of these team comps. They go on at least Thank on you. paper. I need, uh, I, I need do you want that you will I need to consult this robot further because I know. Like, it, how do we? It's like the magic eight ball, but much yeah. more interesting. I think <laughs> we can see that deepest spike there in red. I think that's when Deanna is expected to use her first ultimate, which is a really interesting double spike. Yeah. Uh, because Jace really sucks right then, so it's definitely not a, it's definitely not the Jace <laughs> or the Reddit to contribute. But that that is really interesting that the bodies that detailed. Uh, thank you, Blitzcrunk Sun. Uh, that's something I hadn't thought about before. It's always uh, super interesting. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, yeah. We're a family, and welcome to the LJL, even if it's not ours per se. It is the official streams, and uh, we use and abuse it gladly. Wait until you see the first jungle clear pathing tool they've got, which will show uh, the exact path everybody took with nice lines drawn across the map, oh. where, like in real time. It's great. I am um, uh, envious in the extreme. All right, we are seeing some standard playouts here. Uh, okay. Props to Megamin, who hasn't uh, taken the more cowardly path against the Rennington, which is completely fine for the Lee Sin, because Rennington at level 3 is one of the few champions who's stronger at level 3 than the Lee Sin. Crash going to delay that blast plan and will give this up to Hoglet. You don't 1v1 the Olaf if no. you can help it. Uh, instead, we'll try and sprint down. This is going to be a close contest on the bottom side. Pressure equalized in mid, so it's all to play for. Both mids having significant wave clear. Paz... Pushing in Eno, the Gangplank will struggle for a little while, and to be honest, it ain't going to get much better to level 6 where he can contribute elsewhere, try and make that Jace less too useful than himself. I mean, a winning out the push on this wave, so Hoglet respecting, and didn't walk yeah. down, and uh, just do sometimes what I do, especially in solo queue, and you know, it's not completely alien and competitive to just run through mid to uh, go as fast as you can towards that crab on the bottom oh. side. Uh, yeah. The main thing I'm finding interesting right now, a little bit of a CS disparity in bot. I can't see yeah. if there's a wave. That's, was, uh, that's I, It's difficult to see. It was Gango and Enti just managed to get a really hard shove. Burned a lot of the mana there to Gango. It does take a little bit of a nasty trade there. That uh, Satchel Charge had been an inch further back could have been a bit more problematic, but they burned a lot of mana to shove in early to buy pressure for Crash, um, which obviously worked out in his favor, oh, especially yes. considering where the Olaf was. But... Um, just seems like some of the boomerang blade poke, some of those prowling projectile poke has done its work at least early on and uh, has led to something like half a wave just over of discrepancy down here in the bot side, which is good news for Gango and Enti, who, despite some of those mid game woes, have been good in lane. That's not really been the problem for this team. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I am reasonably happy with this because, like, whenever you see that Sivir, you, you, so, you sort of get a. Uh... Either you think to Reckless, the the main like severe player across the globe, because oh. it's known like, like like on any patch he will just like turn around to his coach and say, ah, oh, get me severe. Like this is a severe game. It's like, are you sure, my friend? <laughs> it's been many many years um, since severe has sort of been the main point of focus Probably, yeah. for really anything. And uh, whenever uh, you pull it out, it's got to be a main point of confidence, uh, and it's got to be player driven because uh, Lord knows the meta doesn't think about severe too much. <laughs> Apparently not, is in mid lane. A little bit of that trading we called out. Nemo is around, managed to get first roam off. Of course, Yumi, not the strongest roamer unless attached to somebody. <laughs> uh, she can sort of get picked up. You gotta you gotta drive her to lane yeah. uh, with the jungler. It's like, you know when you take your pets out for walks in the car? You know, they just really stick you in the back stick Yumi in the back seat, let her prowl around, look out the window. That, that's her exercise for the day. She's not really I can't a, remember an who it is. Cat. Some personality or caster, I really can't remember. Uh, this was like late last year when a uh, Yumi sort of uh, Yumi Graves or Yumi Kazix was oh. uh, really popular, and you'd like Yumi Olaf, pick up the right? Yumi to go invade. Yeah, Yumi Olaf, especially, would be like, yeah, you take the cat for a walk. You uh, you go down there, you stick the leash on. Uh, sometimes they would just like really give it away if they were inexperienced Yumi players. They'd just uh, you know jump off the carry and like walk into the jungle. It's like, oh, I wonder where the jungler is right now. Uh, we might see a little bit of a uh, crash picking up some friends as the mid lane. Ooh, oh, that was blocked by a minion. 
Never mind. Two, two. I mean, Crash won't yeah. be far off level six either. Is a couple camps behind, so maybe does need to clear one or two more. As Gango Ooh. does get pulled back, now has to burn the cleanse. Nice little combo there from Honey and Nemo, especially considering level sixes aren't that far away. Maybe that summoner spell will come back to haunt Gango, who's run about as much safety as he can on Sivir right here. You really do, just before six for this Leona as well, the solar flare being that much of a threat. And uh, huge props to Nemo there. Normally, that engage, not a great idea. Layers the CC around Gango's choosing and forces the cleanse. If Gango did not burn that summoner, it wouldn't be a, a Yumi with half mana on full health. It would be your coming out of lane before level six which really doesn't want to happen here for uh nemo oh sorry for nt and gango both of these champions rely on their ultimates relatively heavily and uh we don't want to see them vulnerable if sengoku want to stay at this current sitting presence where they're wave up and things are looking relatively happy looking in gold is pretty much dead even no objectives have gone down there's been a little bit of scuffling back and forth but Everything is relatively stable right here. It's a little bit of an edge for uh, Hogla over Crash in terms of clear speed. It is an Olaf. Diana probably wants a little bit of AP before she starts hard, hard clearing in the same way. And then similar sort of advantages for Gango in the bot side, of course, on the Sivir, who did get a lot of shoving in early. Um, and that leaves with the game state that's like 200 gold apart right now. And I I'm really expecting probably now that level sixes have come through for mm. the likes of Crash that maybe maybe we might be do some action well if we're to believe let's san this is this is the time this, this is, is the, the place <laughs> and we look to diana for the future um because that will be most of sengoku's playmaking here we might see an opt in so so when you've got the zigs and the these lee sins for axis those wave clearing champions sengoku have to really be careful where they position crash if they want to just uh always be on to these objectives it looks like they're going to initiate a trade here instead completely fine for both teams they can think about this with the zigs being able to survive nice and easy in the bottom lane even with the yumi and uh Sivir rushing forwards with the cc it's quite hard to reach a zigs you won't get all of that lockdown before the satchel charge gets you away crash will get that ocean dragon it's a fine pickup most of its efficacy is already used but i don't think paz and ramune will be upset about that one Nemo will return to the bottom lane, still not level 6, crucially, has donated a lot of XP to Honey, who leads his two opponents, but his support is behind. It is at the minute. Once Nemo hits level 6, Leona, of course, does get a big spike in power herself. Um, bit of a lore matchup here, Diana versus Leona. It's been a pretty common one, honestly, <laughs> this split anyway. Yeah. So, uh, especially with you know, all this sentinel malarkey going on right now as well. You know, you know, Diana having her time in the lore, son, despite how... Um, I don't know, but it's like, 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 I've had my issues with the, the deployment of Lord. Yeah. We'll, we'll maybe move past that. Now's not the time for me to go into a narrative design rant. Um, I can my my only that. comment, my only comment is the Journal of Justice is sorely missed. <laughs> well, uh, no no need to talk about summoning anymore. That, <laughs> no, that, uh, that'll that, do. That, that's law <laughs> long dead. Um, instead, see Gango down about 10% mana there. Just kind of waiting for a reset alongside actually NT as well. They both hit that level six mark. You see um, very low mana bars there. But Diana, just top side, there is a Herald in inventory for Hoglet here as well. So could maybe look to use that Herald plus Ziggs for a full tower rather than just a couple plates because Satchel Charge plus Herald is uh, pretty damn devastating, all things said and done. It is. But it's half a plate away from a full tower, which, you know, when you're yeah. donating carries and you're thinking about things, Hoglet, has he found a way in? No. <laughs> nice and dice, no. No, we can find anything. It's ten minutes in, and just like Jungler's like, can we find anything? No. SG no, have been great at placing their vision, and Hoglet's sure. been great at saying, well, you know, this is here. I'm not going to play games. I'm going to go get my CS lead in the jungle because I clear slightly faster than the Diana, or at least slightly. And Diana will eventually catch up. We do see that lead pretty much stabilized at nine CS now. Been that way for a few minutes with a couple of rubber bands each way. The thing that I really want to see here, so when, when Sengoku traded for that dragon, they effectively decreased the value of the Rift Herald. Like, a lot of the value of first Rift Herald get that, like, lane auto-pressured because you clear the wave, drop the Herald, it must be answered, or Herald's uh, swings at the tower offer a lot of value. Oh, oh. Well, I'm so sorry. Like, 
this happens again and again with Axis' jungle. Oh, he knew. He knew, maybe. It's like, okay, so, he does now. It's fine. And yeah. honestly, this being telegraphed isn't necessarily a bad thing. You have the tools to fight. It just mm. means it's going to be a bit more uh, with everybody on the same page. They yeah. get the shove in. They get the two plates. Mega Min and Ramane just scuffling in the river. Crash is just over the back with the Yumi. Wait for the big engage. Potentially, but Mega Min kicks away. So Dominus for the Dragon's Rage and little more found aside from the Herald Charge. And now Gango needs to be very aware that leaving that lane for any given time will result in that tower fall. Yeah, well, the Civ are very effective at clearing the wave, as we mentioned, but gets bounced around by the Ziggs a fair bit. The Spell Shield, very difficult to time when both players are familiar with the matchup. I'd Honestly, if you turned all the nameplates off, didn't tell me which game this was, take everything away, I'd say Honey had played against the Civ recently. Uh, which I haven't noticed, but then again, I am uh, on 9 a.m. brain, which is not my strongest brain. Uh, if it's you can do what it. What is your strong? Did you change brains through the day? Uh, oh, never maybe. mind. I'm going to talk about a play in the top side. Never mind changing brains to talk about <laughs> dueling top laners. Paz had to flash out of the cannon barrage. So I have to teleport out. Hogger's going to flash out. I get the last yes. one. Flash is the V3 symbol as well. Because, of course, Paz went to Worlds in 2020. And much like Worlds 2020, it's a little bit of a flat exit coming through for the top laner for Sengaku. Hoglet knows, and even though Paz respects the presence, he sees the Axis jungler coming. Hoglet has no mercy for a Jace that just tried to burn his flash to tower dive. And while it left Eno reeling under tower, the Sengoku top laner steps a little too far, a little too fast, and our favorite barbarian puts his sentinel armor on and runs it straight down to the tower. We'll see this play start off now. Eno and Paz dueling. They both know, even though these are both half health, both of these top laners able to explode. Eno sees a moment where maybe he can take out Paz. Flash is traded. Paz going a little too far. Didn't expect the cannon barrage, perhaps. Expected the Axis' top laner to save it. Hoglot with no mercy sees the teleport, sees it is in range, and takes out first blood on the Sengoku top laner of Paz. We'll call it out again. V3 Worlds 2020. <laughs> yeah, Hoglot is <laughs> specifically for this game. Specifically for Paz. Oh, it's going that the other way. It's a brutal metal warfare, but it might just have made Paz angry. Crashes here, has the moonfall. Uh, make it like Pink Floyd, because that was Dark Side of the Moonfall. No way out for him at that time. He's on the weak side of the map. Uh, Leona's right on the other, and not going to be there to help defend at all. Hoglet will trade this one for a dragon. Uh, it'll even those up as one apiece, but a uh, nice response from Sengoku at the top side. Fantastic. Uh, Arigato blitzkrank -san. That is exactly your timing for Diana's ultimate. That dip is red, and the gold pickup definitely uh, will be enjoyed by Sengoku. They do lose an Infernal Dragon. At this stage, it's not it's not too bad for the Sengaku composition. Uh, you're looking to get to the stage where Olaf isn't a threat onto the Civet, which is the deep late game. When you delay these dragons, splitting them across the teams, you delay an Elder Dragon that can potentially uh, make an early game exit uh, possible for your opponents and uh, apply a lot of pressure and to sort of twist the game where either team with a small lead can accelerate faster. Instead, that's all going to calm down right now. And uh, we can just be taking this one a little bit longer. Yeah, and, you know, called it just briefly during that as well. You know, Paz gets first turret off that, which is good news for the Jace. A little Ooh. bit of a turnaround considering how things were getting a little bit scary after the attempted play from Inno by his tower. Um, it is traded back pretty quickly by Honey uh, in the bot side, especially because Hoglet just stands in the bush behind the tower, throwing under toes at Gango and Entin saying, yeah, you just don't get to walk up here. Uh, and that leaves us at a gold state that, again, is still only a couple hundred apart. It's a dragon apiece. The only real uh, discrepancy has been that first Herald, which got evened up because Paz gets to do Jace things in the top side and take that tower early on with a, a little bit of assistance from Crash. Definitely. We are opening up to a bigger picture of the game here now. We see those CS discrepancies. This will sort of be the final way to compare laning phase. The mm. Sivir caught up to the Ziggs. And that lead between Crash and Hoglet just stayed the same, which means Crash is yep. in. A deep teleport here from Ramune. Sengoku will be fighting oh, the objective. It goes down, He's... but the oh, fight is on. Oh, what a flat. Ramune to the backside, and that's a final chance for the turnaround because that cannon barrage is pretty huge. Ramune gets a double. He might might dead a triple, but no, it is Paz that picks that up. And Sengoku gaming, what a beautiful teleport flank.
a deep flank, Rennington's favorite place to be when he doesn't have to expand flash, expend flash to get on to a carry for that slice and dice to make sure he's in position for that long stern. Loads of damage coming through from his team. It opens up for an excellent moonfall from Crash, even though some members of Sengoku fall. So it is not an absolute victory. So we'll go back now. We see this teleport onto the blue buff. Starts up Ramane off vision in bottom side. Axis don't know this is coming. Fantastic timing to call the teleport when the wave is cleared. Hoglet will get the Herald, but it's Herald 2 and Ramane straight into the back. Straight on at two, honey. He falls so, so fast, and you can't cast spells when you are dead. This zigs even <laughs> no. with his fantastic setup and multiple items, and anti-heal doesn't get to cast a thing, and that will be a gold advantage, even though it is minor over to a Sengoku side that we were worried about, but maybe Blitzkrieg-san is on straight. This is going to be a close, close game. That is some uh, impressive damage numbers out of both the Gangplank and, of course, the Renekton in there, Ramane. May have been struggling a little bit, but when they ha when he has looked good, Sengoku have looked so much better. That was some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, Ped, you know, Dominus up, which in fact does help Renekton expand, even if Flash doesn't. Uh, hint, hint, Temporal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> alongside these, like the final chapter from Yumi and the Moonfall, just massive wombo combo. I shouldn't really throw my color caster into the bus like do that. It, but do hey, it. it's, it's fun. It's it. great. Uh, it's great. <laughs> the fun was sitting there, and I, I, I felt the urge, and here we are. Uh, just trades of vision from top side of the map for Axis, for bottom side of the map, really, for Sengoku. And there's the Yumi on top of the Diana. The pair of ultimates there makes that combo absolutely brutal. Moonfall will hold people in place long enough for final chapter to uh, get red, really, and keep people in place even longer. Um, pretty threatening combo now, I think, about it all things said and done. And Ramane is here with a uh, Herald and Infantry. Going to try and chase run down Hoglet, who's Ragnarok away as fast as he can. But I just don't think he can get far if it's a decent heal. Manages oh. to get Ramane over the wall. But I think because he was Ragnaroking, he's immune to the knockup. It was maybe less than a tenth of a second there before Ragnarok was wearing off. Oh, Honey, oh, desperately. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, it's okay. H's. <laughs> um, oh. uh, it, like 0 0.1, 0 0.1 seconds. And uh, he'd swung, so the, he swung the auto attack sort of as it faded. And the Blast Plant was like, I can't move you right now. And uh, would have would have got away with it too if it wasn't for all of Sengoku sprinting at him. A top speed. Uh, I do want to highlight something for Gango quickly as well. Choosing yes. this lethality style on the Civ, oh, and most wow. recently, uh, sort of discussion with Reckless, I believe, or um, someone behind the staff on that team, it was like, well, AD carry Civ, it still occupies the same position. You know, you normally look for the AD carry items. You go for the Kraken in default. You go for the um, the Immortal Shield Bow in setups where Civ needs that survivability, and Gale Force if you need the Zaya Alt esque. Uh, flash or get away from danger and uh, it's very open like that instead we're back to lethality severe this was previously removed with uh misfortune's uh, lethality setup way back oh, when yeah. turns out even when you turn off all the lethality just going invisible on an ad carry that also makes your yumi invisible uh and does deal a considerable amount of damage to low armor targets when you've got these mages and low ad bruises and then a bit of lethality for jace as well this goes a long way uh, I'm going to be exciting to see just how much damage Gango can dish out. There's only so much armor Ziggs can build. While yeah. Dragon 2 is going over to Sengoku as they continue this sort of play, you know, maybe wishes his positioning had been a bit more wise. Uh, he Ooh. does manage to get the flash out, but the uh, Crescent Strike, there we go, took me a second, did hit. Doesn't matter though, because Ramane will just flash it and secure his third kill of the game. All the while though, Axis did manage to secure literally two out of towers while all that was happening which is probably why you know was thinking well yeah they've taken drake but we're pushing everywhere else surely they wouldn't come down this way and they did um bit of a mistake gold mm. still even as a result of that and the few kills that went over with the herald but decent turnaround play on the grand scheme of things at least in terms of getting some structures down this is sort of what I alluded to with where maybe Sangro can want to slow this one down. When Axes get to accelerate with this composition, we just saw like towers just explode in moments in, in the time it takes a Rennington to walk between two towers. Uh, and that's kind of scary. And Axis, sure, as the game goes longer, they get more of these chances. Sure. But Sengoku don't really want to respond. They don't want to interact with these, um, especially 
because if they, if they have to play certain things, if they have to be certain places at certain times, if they extend between towers of kills, Axis have really got some tools to uh, break things open. Uh, I want to highlight some uh, extra special communication between NT and Crash there. NT, even though he's on support, took a cannon minion just to make sure he could buy that Luden's Echo, just to make yeah. sure Sengoku's current rotation don't have to base again before this Baron. And, uh, clearly, they are aware that if they can't play objectives, if they need messy bases, this Axis composition, oh, so good when it is out on the map with that time, so efficient and so open to breaking up infrastructure. Very much so, and I've got to call it out as well. You know, we, we did mention that lethality Sivir is something I know uh, that has been hovering around for Sivir a little bit, you know, a couple patches ago, yes, but uh, uh, something that Nymera, interestingly, was, was talking with a, a guy called Gregors, who is an AD character uh, there in the UK scene. I like uh, Gregors. Yeah, Gregus is a lovely guy, um, but he was a really big proponent of the lethality Sivir, so uh, oh. might be worth picking the uh, Nymera's brains about that at some point. I know he'll be on later in the day, so uh, might throw that one over to him, but certainly offers a lot more poke. The boomerang blade in particular is pretty damn nasty with the mm. lethality, even if you're a little less auto attack focused. Oh, yeah. Uh, and of course, the added utility from the items, like invisible on an AD carrier. <laughs> Ooh, it's... It's so it's enjoyable. <laughs> so enjoyable. Um, I normally look to Greg as for his Zaya play, which is uh, something exciting. Yeah. I love the guy on Zaya. He, he, he's so calm and collected and able to really make the use of Zaya's tools. And it was always impressive when I watched his games. A quick Baron setup from Axis, broken open by a blue trinket. Yeah. So Back we'll over just... to the other side of the globe quickly. Yeah. Uh, like, oh, we, we are, we are globe trotters over here. Yeah, like, indeed, uh, indeed. We could just rock between some scenes. It's fun. Yeah, um, a little, a little bit of a shout out there due where it's due for a little bit of oh, knowledge yeah. where it's necessary. But we are still left with a very close game state, and Sengoku have done this before, where they've got decent points of power on the map. Though admittedly, not normally on Ramane, who, as we said, has often been a little bit disconnected from the team. Not so today. That week off seems to have done him uh, wonders in terms of synergy with the team. Good stuff mm. there. But now this is the point where Sengoku are falling apart in the past. This is a point where things have got a bit rough for them, and Axis have been in this situation before a couple times, this where the early game or the mid-game has been mid-game in particular, is kind of maybe they've dropped a couple kills, uh, and, and things have got a bit more even, but the later the game goes, the, the more Axis uh, seem to come out on top. So they've won most of the late-game scenarios they've been in versus the likes of DFM, Rascal Jesters, two of our more veteran, terrifying teams when it comes to team fights in the late game, so... Uh, you know, this is potentially if Sengaku historically started falling off at this point and Axis have started ramp ramping up in contrast, then maybe this is a point where Sengaku start to fall away. But, you know, look at this composition. Yumi, Diana, Sivir with lots of blow-up pokers. Um, it's not like that's going to be entirely awful versus things like the Ziggs if you can get on top of them. No, I think uh, Sengaku may be saying, oh, hey, you know, we struggle to do what we want and engage when we want to, so let's just put a load of tools into our composition. <laughs> let's let's make the run at them a dream reality, and uh, hopefully going that way. It's not the easiest to a gangplank ultimate. We see Eno picking up the chainsword, yeah, doing maxi second. maximum utility for his team here to deny all of that healing, and Zig's going to the Morello second as well. This is a path we uh, we normally criticize. Hoglet is running up here. It's a bit of a reach, though. So he's not going to quite continue their paths. We'll try and get the pinch Hoglet. in. Hoglet will take a bit of damage. Teleport in. This is a lot of committal for a pinch point that doesn't have too much worry until that dragon is started. Then Goku not wanting to late, let themselves in late, seemingly. Yumi joins the Renix, and they're looking forwards. Eno poked away. Remini taking a bit of damage. Here we go. Solar Ramane. Flare. Massive solar flare, the cannon barrage as well, splitting the team up, but Ramana just murders Leona, it's just gone. And now the turnaround continues, Inno gets crashed, so who did go in deep, and now the turnaround damage, the anti heal is there. Inno survived on a sliver of HP. I thought after the Leona had died, after the blow up come through, and he didn't manage to succeed the first time round, it was doomed. But that turnaround damage, Inno's cleanse flash, with the help of a few oranges he kept in his pocket, just too much. 
barren I, now as well. I, I can't believe it. This must be a Sengoku curse. You've, you've called it initialized. I didn't believe it till I saw it. The anti-heal, like, overstacking, it is frankly overstacking even with the Yumi. Going that much further, Ramune as a frontline is enabled right now, but Nemo, or a member of Axis, makes the call. This Rennington that survives for so long just doesn't keep going. Just able to, even though he takes out Nemo, not living as long as possible. Gango, Gango falls in the back line. That's huge. Mega Min, this proper assassin right now. And of course, when you take out that front line with the Yumi, unless there's someone to pick them up and Gango's already fallen, not able to carry on in the fight. And that is so rough for a Sengoku side that almost looked like they'd found their way in. No huge moonfall from Crash and maybe a bit of disconnection on where their front line was and what the priority was in that fight. It opens up the dragons at two apiece. Axes won't be too unhappy with this. We've mentioned both teams kind of want to make it go to late for different reasons. And Axis is bot lane carry in Honey now, starting to power up. Won't be far away from that Zonya's, which will make Sengoku's life that much harder. And I see the beginnings of a death cap, which will just oh, blow this one open. <sighs> Unfortunately, so for Sengoku and their fans, it was looking really good, but. Ramane, you know, turns around on the Leona, but the final chapter splits apart, doesn't really get onto anybody. Crash only hits kind of two middling members, and Inno gets to flash away. And so we're going to see a turnaround there on the top side. He can't flash that one. Does get the cannon barrage off, though, but Nemo is being run down by Ramane on the side. Big poke back from Honey. And now Enti and Ramane are on the side. It's going to be another final chapter coming through the poke. Still there. Gango safe with the shield. Hoglet goes golden, but it is only a momentary respite for the jungler he'll fall as well and it's just trade for trade this time the turnaround engage from sengoku is the one that comes out trumps huge praise for crash in that fight recognizes the lull state um diana's cooldowns not that long but you need them for a fight recognizes it you know flashed away last fight he gave everything to his team and got away with a sliver of health which is what you want to see from the gangplank that leaves him vulnerable up on the wave the haste from the rocket belt coming forwards and the zonya's now completed eats so many cooldowns that's a solar flare and mega inferno bomb and all they do is reduce someone who's already used all their cooldowns health crash respects stays out of the fight and it opens up for ramune it opens up uh, on this Axis frontline, and with NT nearby, the cooldowns aren't there. They were just all used in a major fight. It's just a way back in. Sengoku get a little bit more gold over. This is what their composition has to do. You find a moment where the Zig's slightly out of position, where Eno goes a little too far. Remember, we spoke, spoke about Hogler as his conditional frontline. If he can't offer that right now, then Sengoku can really open up, and it's their way to stay in this game. They need to find more fights like this. Man, we thought this should be a walkover for Axis been looking so good, and we've actually got a close, close game. It stunted the Baron buff power play. They don't really get a lot out of it. Do Axis don't manage to break any of the tier twos? We're at a state now where there's Diana at three items, has an Oblivion, uh, not Oblivion, or a Morellonomicon of her own to counter the double gore drinker. We've got a Jace at three items. Cyril does grudge to match the, the two item power spike that Jace runs with that Eclipse plus the Transform Muramana. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the gloves are off and the hats are on. Honey has got the death cap after Ooh. that play. Ooh. He's delaying his Zhonya's. He still holds the uh, vanilla stopwatch. So going a little further on that. There is only one item missing on the board I want to see. I want to see this uh, Sivir pick up a certain Serpent's Fang on four. I think it's mm. the way forwards for her. Uh, one boomerang blade destroying two Sterax. And remember, she's always finding this Lee Sin on top of her in fights. We see it on Eno for the cannon barrage of those abilities to apply it. As Axis continue to siege this bottom tower, that's the assignment they've chosen themselves, and they are sticking to it rather religiously. Uh, sticking down there. But I want to see this Sivir be able to move these assassins apart. Sure, it doesn't help too much when like getting onto the Ziggs. It will break through that locket, bear in mind, but that's a small, uh, small price to pay for breaking open two huge Sterak shields. Axes continue doing what they want to do on this side of the map. With the dragon coming up, they've gained priority in bottom lane. While they haven't quite got it in middle, that is such a deep shove in bottom. It now creates a dynamic where they can move through Sengoku's jungle. You'll meant to see Crash and Ramine trying to hold this corner. Even then, it's looking a little dicey. Teleport in from Paz. Sengoku know they have to fight this. They have a sort of weird assignment now where Axes have a safe fadeaway in the bottom. 
it's all very tense. Sengoku needs to find a way in for these tools. You know, they are fishing. Look, look at Enti move between his members. He's trying to find someone with the go button. Crash is fishing. Any moment. Or are they going to let it reset? Oh my goodness. It's getting so tense. Paz, and of course, it's Lethality Sivir. So the poke here from both sides. Well, from, well, from Sengoku's double AD carry is pretty huge. The dragon goes down towards Hoglet, though. And the fight commences. Ramane flashing in the back line, trying to get Honey. Gets him! And Sivir gets another. The turnaround, though, from Inno is pretty huge. Trying to walk around with Hoglet. But he gets pulled back in the move oh, as well. Oh. But it's time! The burn is enough to make it a triple as Trial by Fire gets one. It's five for three. Three, there we go. Finally managed to do some maths. It is the ace though, and Sengoku Gaming just about to cure the team by victory that they did lose the dragon. Man, this game's on a knife edge and the gold is going back towards even again, Temporal. I'm I'm sort of happy. So behind the scenes, <laughs> oh, I got a okay. message. I, I got a message about my predictions a few weeks ago, and it was oh, like, you? "Hey, you get you have some real faith in the Sengoku side, my friend." <laughs> and uh, I am so glad my first cast on the LGL is oh, to reflect boy. it. Where Let's uh, just play through this replay, and enough of is. your smugness. Take me there through what some, earth happens here. There are some huge factors as to why Sengoku pulls it. Look at Honey's mana. That's two bombs and no ultimate if they choose. So they will pause. They wait. They think, hey, if he casts that, just... if he's not thinking about it, it's a huge way in. At the fall of the dragon, Sengoku realize if they fall away, it's all going to fall apart. Olaf coming towards you is not something this team is set up to deal with, as seen in that micro fight at the end there. So Crash and Ramane pull the button, NT helps them get in, they find the zigs. And it, it, it's, it is a case of just a little too late, but Sengoku realize it's only going to go worse they go later. They, they tear off the band-aid, they pull the trigger, and Crash is just looking so good, holding the ultimate for the exact precise time it can have an effect on the in and on the out. Tengoku staying alive. Honey's pulling the trigger. Oh. Hoglet providing that front line. If this goes further, it's going to have to be a huge ultimate. Oh, flash miss from Nemo. The Mega Inferno Bomb I thought was about to murder absolutely everybody. Only really clipped onto one. Spell shields and flashes burned. Yes, but no one has died yet. But now the turnaround is here. Crash gets to go in on top of Inno, who does a lot of damage back onto Crash. The healing's just nowhere near as strong with how much anti-heal they have. And Maybe it was overcapped, but the point is, at least this way, somebody's applying at all times, especially if Cannon Barrage is down, and it means that somehow, nobody <laughs> dies there. Huge praise for Hoglet and Ramane, both offering that conditional front line. So these aren't tanks, they are bruisers, but they are enough to dissuade your opponent from coming forwards. Hoglet now with that Guardian Angel. Oh, so effective on tanks, something we've seen in previous years, and I'm happy to see him move towards it. This is peak Hoglet style from what I've seen in replays, is able to just be that threatening aura. And those aren't traditional tank items, but you offer this front line and it, it's effectively the same thing at the end, but comes out with a whole bunch of damage as well. Uh, but, uh, you get to be a front line in the sense oh, that you, yeah. if you just heal up for so much, I don't care how much and then, anti and then, you have. And then if you're, you're a big gold drinker plus being Olaf, plus no. a GA, plus a Starax, you are disturbingly tanky for someone who does that much damage. Indeed, and then even if they get you, you come up again and Olaf on low health is an even bigger threat. It's uh, <laughs> extra layers to oh, Hoglet's boy. style here. It's so, so good. The tension at the start of that fight, owing to him and Ramane dancing around each other, cooldowns just going left and right, and then the Solar Flare comes through. A bit of a scuffle in shoes as both teams manage it. But uh, Sengoku once again found a little priority in mid. They found their way oh, onto Baron Vision so Axis. Great. Oh, the gate comes through. Crash! The solar Flare's not bad. Inno gets down the Cannon Barrage. Ramane chunked to about half. Crash knocked up as well. Is enjoyable. But Nemo is dead as well. It is two for none right now. Mega Mint into the backside, but doesn't really get a lot done with the kick. Hoglet's around, but solo HP. Mega Bin now being chased down as Paz flashes on in. Is going to find the Shock Blast to bring down Lee Sin. Hoglet respawns below HP. He might be, but still can't find the kill. Honey now now caught on the absolute wrong side of the map is going to teleport back to Nexus Towers to try and keep everybody alive. And he is now here. Paz has got teleport in turn and he can probably clear out the wave, but it's still a long time on people coming back in. The Crescent Strike hits puts Honey down to about half HP and he desperately needs to clear out these minions. Throws the Mega Inferno Bomb to do just that. Good Lord, that damage. And that might have actually just saved the game. Save the game at this stage. Sengoku's so happy with what just looked like an intermediary fight. They found themselves in that mid lane side brush with Vision set up all over the Baron. 
Axes felt they had to check. They they may have had to have checked. Uh, Sengoku do have a decent Baron here. The Lethality Sivir does do a whole bunch of damage with that attack speed steroid on the W. And of course, Crash, a verifiable threat at this stage. Void Staff nearly completed. That Deanna is terrifying. Keeps finding Eno as well. Uh, something that Axis definitely have to address if they want to stay in this game. Sengoku are looking dangerous and it looks like they know how to use it too. As is over on the dragon, but remember he burned his teleports. That means the Axis think it's maybe time to start up a Baron Bait, maybe even start this up. Honey has completed Horizon Focus fourth as well, so if he gets to stay at range, he will hit like a truck onto any squishy member, anybody with low magic resist. But the poke in turn from both the Sivir and the Jace means that it's kind of a 1v2 in terms of the poke war here, unless Aino you know, lands a hell of a Baron, uh, barrel chain, rather a Baron chain, though, uh, that might be the chain of events, at least to the end of this game. And Paz gets to be sent back down to this dragon. will solo this one out, especially with no vision for Axis. Sengoku doing so well at just ignoring that bottom lane. It's technically neutral, but uh, I, I definitely know as a Jace player myself, you, you see that you see that bottom lane stacked up and you really want to go down there and collect all that money. Oh, Instead, like they hold their mid priority. This is the most important thing for them right now. It continues their access onto the Baron and Axis must answer. If they find a way to, Sengoku find a way to get these minions into the Axis base, you gain so much power in where you can position Crash. You can do a repeat where... Axis will never be comfortable giving a Baron against this composition. If you give Ramune the ability to sit forwards in a wave and make those minions oh so difficult for Honey to kill, it really becomes a struggle here for Axis. And they want to avoid that at all costs. So we see repeats where Sangoku can sit in a bush. They can mm -hmm. put these uh, these terrifying picks, the Deanna the Rennington, that have made Honey and uh, sort of Eno's life so difficult this game. And they can just do it again and again and keep finding these threats. With the Zonyas coming through, and I, I imagine we're going to see more frontline options coming through for the Rennington. He's got the stopwatch. He's ready to make that deep dive and get away with it. Look, look, look. We're, we're seeing NT Fish again. Nemo all out. Crash knows exactly what he's doing here. Even though they take a bit of chunk damage back. They are positioning around this key point on the map. And they're just going to keep doing it again. The thing is, it's 1v2 in terms of the poke, plus a Yumi. Yes, you've got anti-heal, but unless you find the wombo combo as Axis, mm. this poke from your end does not stick. At least at this point for Honey, it's not just poke. It is absolute deletion if he catches a squishy member with four items on those eggs. We know how much damage this guy does the later this game goes. But Crucially, Ramune has no magic resist. It nearly betrayed him in the last fight till his fancy feet let him get away with it. There's dodges left and right, but Honey has targets... It's just really hard to kill them before Grievous Runes wears off. And gets about half the hit points onto Ramane, who could heal up if he could get to a wave, and that would be a very risky call. Five items on this Gangplank as well. Lord Dominic's regard in. It's nearly there for Paz as Ooh. well. Oh, as Honey and Nemo just lose half their HP bars to this full lethality Jace. Um, yep, that one stings. That one really stings. It's uh, it's definitely Honey versus Paz right now. What they can give their teams in terms of an opening. Teleport in. Ramune not wanting to spend any time. We do we do have a little bit of an ARAM opening up. But Sengoku keep getting priority on these waves. Paz keeps finding shock blasts. NT very aware. Nemo's got, got it. Oh! Yeah. Tries to get something, but Paz just deleted it. It was a nice idea, but it just got too much damage too quickly. Now, Honey and Inno need to disengage. Hoglet is there, but remember, he's going to be able to blast cone out from that one. Crash has got so much of a shield with the Pale Cascade that there is no way for Axis to find anything in that fight. Nemo, I appreciate the bold call. I appreciate the attempt, but the turnaround damage was just, just too much. I was so selfless from Nemo, maybe a little too much. I didn't even expect it. A very desperate reach over the wall, saying, oh, like, this can't carry on. Like, I have to engage. It's like, maybe maybe a reset would have served better. Uh, and if you stagger those, very difficult. Oh, you know, yeah. like, you're, you're gone, my friend. Paz, he, you're thought gone. maybe Holly could come and help, but no, Paz nope. just gets to come in. Uh, empowered autos, courtesy of ranged form W. And, uh, well, that's yep. a very dead gangplank. Very dead at this stage. Uh, Gangplank has built that utility for his team. The Collector, you know, will take out anyone early. So we see this fight open again. Look to Nemo. Paz, 
Uh, takes him down. That's only 600 health, a quick count of the ticks. Nemo flashes and goes for it. Follow-up from Mega Man, maybe not communicated. Hoglet is there, but Paz able to just step away. And meanwhile, the other members of Axis suffering that their front line has uh, just taken a bit of a snow dive over the wall, able to block the follow-up that can't go over the wall with him. And just a, a little bit of danger as Sengoku, I think we can call that a gold lead initialize. I think we can. I think that's a 4,000 gold lead. I think yeah. that's not. In fairness, 41 minutes into the game, yeah. not that big a deal. The problem, it, it, what is a big it's deal? It's one item somewhere. Oh, all right. Well, yeah, the good spell yeah. shield meant that Gango didn't take any damage. And that, again, is also making Honey's life a little bit tricky. But uh, it makes a difference. Does that goal lead? It makes a difference in terms of the map pressure. It makes a difference in terms of, like, um, there's a lot of squishy members being hit by Jace Poke and Siva Poke consistently and we've mentioned it before but on the other side there is yumi's and spell shields that's making the return poke the return burst significantly less valuable significantly less i wonder if it speaks to so i don't, I don't want to say axis don't play mages um but this isn't what we know honey and axis for uh in their success this year and maybe if they're a little more comfortable they're able to play it forwards a little more we saw honey and nemo do fantastic things around the spell shield in lane but now that we're in that more, uh, like, less well-documented space almost, where things aren't as controlled as your lane, we found Ramane and Crash finding honey time and time again in these fights, and maybe it's something we have to look for for an improvement. Megumin is in deep. He's on vision on mid. Sengoku are getting engaged on it. Slow, but it's coming. Ave Maria, it is the Hail Mary. It worked versus DFM back in week one. It might work here in week six. What well, the five? We're not quite there yet. Super Week is getting oh, me crash. all over the place. Much like Crash is into the back line. Hogler has tried, but there's just not enough in the tank. The prayers will not be answered. And Sengoku Gaming will take down Axis. They will find a first win in the first game of Super Week for us here in the LJLOU. The emotes come up and they will move to 2 and 7. Axis, still mortal, it would seem. Still mortal, it would seem. What would the odds be if we discussed that happening before the game? I would not have believed you when you said Ramane looked calm, confident. There was only one disconnect where I could say, hey, that looks like current season Sengaku. Other than that, a tense game. Uh, from both sides, and Sengoku just know when to pull the trigger after a slightly slower start. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the moment the copium runs out for my analysts, Sengoku <laughs> Gaming find the win. <laughs> Truly, well, maybe not counter logic, but it'll do just here. But we are going to have to cut to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have an analyst desk to talk us more about this shock upset win. So hold our heads up high and beat the drum to what we love. 
risk the fall or we have felt it all come crashing down from far above Stars are rising, countless worlds colliding, only one will take it all Can we bring to fall the giants? Can we make the final call? Welcome back, everybody, to the officially unofficial official desk of the officially unofficial official LJL League. That was a mouthful. I didn't pre-plan it. Happy we got through it. Just like I'm happy we got through that game in particular. I think Sengoku feeling very happy they got through that one. Could they possibly be turning their season around? It might be too little too late, but definitely a good start. As we now are going to break this game down, let's go all the way back to those picks and bans. And straight away, something that I noticed coming up through the scenes, Yumi Mundo has been a thing rising on the scene. We see the Yumi pick expecting the Yum, like the Mundo to come through. But then Sengaku bans the Mundo for the Sivir instead and initialize. What you were saying is this actually wasn't that surprising. Potentially not in the... What the assumption in some ways was for at least us on the desk and... I think potentially for Axis as well, was that would just be a regular, you know, like crit civic, you know, you build it with the Krakens there, all the rest of it, maybe the Gale Force to, you know, avoid people running at you like the, like the Olaf or whatever. And it wasn't, it was the Duskblade uh, Muramana build, which is very much another poke option alongside the Jace, which got picked up later as well. You pair that up with the Yumi and suddenly you've got double poke versus a squishy team comp on the other side. I mean, like, you've got Olaf, who's, you know, health builder, not really strict, um, you know, tank. You've got the Le Leona, yes, but, you know, needs a few items for truly tanking. You saw what happened in the late game anyway. So double toke, toke, poke, plus the heal from the Yumi, versus just the Ziggs on the other side. So you don't get to play the Ziggs as a poke tool, really, because it just gets healed up by Yumi. And on the other side, the squishy members are getting, you know, twice as much poke at, thrown at them compared to uh, compared to the Ziggs just for Axis. So quite a smart adaptation, I think, to build that Sivir as poke and then kind of, like, flex the team comp in that way. Yeah, it definitely felt like, in that regard, you know, they did sort of big brain that draft. They took something a little less conventional. But it was also a draft that, they had to use their smarts in the decision making throughout that game. And the same thing you could actually say for the access side as well. This game really came down to the decision making in and of itself and when to pull the trigger and when not to pull the trigger. And that felt like something that coming into this, maybe access would have had the advantage. But looking at this game temporal, that really wasn't the case this time around. Decision making heavily favored Sengoku. Uh, Sengoku like, had a team composition that pulls uh, pulls the trigger and burns ultimates and takes names when it does so. Um, even though we found Megamin sort of doing this sort of thing in the early game and finding uh, the Sivir especially, um, it turned around the other way throughout the game. We saw Crash pull key moments in lol states, getting that gold back, becoming the threat that Deanna can be. 
paired up with another threat in the Rennington, it was almost too much for Axis's front line to deal with. Only Hoglet, only conditional, only heals when he's in combat. Doesn't want to be in combat with the wrong people because he's also a backline threat. And it's almost too much for Hoglet to deal with when these setups have so many people involved, when the Ziggs isn't able to clear sidewaves and really pull your opponent apart across the map to the point they have to commit teleports. And when they run out, that's really Ziggs's place to shine where you make your opponent's choices impossible. Instead, it was Sengoku in that position, holding that Baron Pit at the keen team fight that turned the game around. And Axis looked stretched. They they had to engage. We lost the Leona early on. They weren't able to execute Ramine. And it really fell apart for Axis from then onwards. And you're bringing up like how some of that earnest fell onto the Ziggs, who was Honey. And we are coming in saying, like, you know, Honey has been amazing thus far. Can we see that versatility? So now taking that step back, is this a worrying sign? Is Honey actually a bit more sort of in that one trick play style than we initially thought? And is this a weakness that can be exploited against Axis in the future? I wouldn't worry too much yeah. about this. Uh, he looked great in lane. The Ziggs opened up a small lead and paired with the Leona. They, they'd even played around the Sivir as if they'd seen it before. They were very careful with the spell shield. They managed it to perfection, I would imagine, in that moment-to-moment. -moment. When you get into the later game, you need to do more things with the Ziggs. It's something I'm sure Axis' coaching staff and the infrastructure will be looking to work on. They, they, it's better they have this game now than they have it in playoffs when it might really stun them. Uh, and I presume that's why they've taken this line against the struggling Sengoku side. And then it's it's been met by a rising Sengoku, which is the unfortunate thing. Because I think if we look at previous week's Sengoku against this, it's it's over at 25. It, it ain't looking good. Um, <laughs> but instead, sort of the, the, the struggle of Axis getting that rotational play style and the Gangplank sort of feeds into it as well, where they should be pulling their opponents to keep the gold going um, for Sengoku. They should be like moving them around the map and Axis being in that driver's seat. And instead, it just didn't quite work out this game. I mean, mean to jump yeah, in there. Briefly, yeah, I do. Just, yep. just as a final thought as well. Like, you know, also wasn't the easiest game for the six. Like, you've got <laughs> double poke versus your own. So you can't uh -huh. win from that position. And you've got to be really careful about stepping forward to throw that poke down in the first place because then Diana, Yumi, or Renekton flashes on you uh, and you get CC'd into a final chapter for more CC and you die. So it, that's like. I, 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 I agree that it wasn't the best look for Axis, but I also think mm. there were a lot of answers in the Sengoku draft to make the Ziggs' life very difficult. Uh, and credit to Sengoku, particularly in the late game, for turning it around after that one particular dragon fight nearly cost them a lot. It is interesting, though, when you take that step back and go like, okay, so perhaps overall this wasn't a team composition that Axis may have been comfortable coming into it, and perhaps they only did take this team composition just because, you know, they're in that position where it's very, very likely they'll be in playoffs, so now is the time when we start to experiment and start to try different looks and see how it pays out, and we are didn't have a chance to really get into it during the pregame, but it was something that I didn't want to talk about. Typically in the LJL, these situations don't happen. Usually it's a fight till that very end. So teams don't have that opportunity to try different styles. Do you think that could have been a key reason why Axis perhaps didn't look as comfortable in that mid and late game as they potentially could have? Hmm. I think potentially, yeah. Uh, there's got, there is an element of that. It's just like not necessarily the same kind of spikes they've gone to before yes the zigs scales very well absolutely but you know it's not necessarily a protect the hyper carry comp with the thresh in particular to allow some more aggressive positioning from honey uh which of course enamor has also looked very good on this is a bit more of a mid game comp you know you've got the lee sin you've got the leona you've got the olaf you know you hit two items one and a half on those guys you run at things like the herald and second third drake and you, you find victories right and that kind of happened, right? They got a big swing, they got the Baron, and then Inno oversteps looking for that tier two, and Diana gets a, uh, a catch and kind of pulls the game back and stalls it out long enough for uh, the late game hyper lethality poke to start coming through. Um, so, so I think there's some truth to that. Um, but I, I'll also say, you know, that maybe, you know, Axis, there was some moments in this game where it was looking okay particularly around some of those mid-game fights just late game for once where they, they just didn't quite have the answers uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah you've, you've hit all the marks there it uh it, it almost looks so good right almost and then these small parts of this composition like we see the leona with the zigs and that's like the pairing but it's not axis's pairing um uh, maybe the thresh would have gone a moment or two further here 
um, and really helped them out in those key moments where the front line uh, for Sengoku were able to just pull out gold. Yeah, well, I suppose in that regard, though, if they were so close but not quite there, the good news for Axis is, well, they get to go straight uh, back out to the Rift and kind of go at it again. Maybe they'll have a different look. Maybe it'll be something similar. But this time, you can argue that their opponents are going to be a little bit tougher. And Destination Focus Me, I believe, is who they are up against. Next, mm. good old DFM, who seem to be on a rise back to their top form. And a lot of that... You'd have to credit to Arya back in form. Steel has been playing amazing. And Gang, since they came back to the lineup, has kind of kept that team, I believe, a lot more controlled. So I have to ask, what sort of changes do you want to see from Axis in this matchup now coming up against DFM? Ampro, want to take this one? I do. I, I, I don't remember exactly the uh, playoffs run for LJL. I can't remember if it's upper lower bracket or just you know, everyone fights everyone. Upper, so lower. Yeah. upper and lower. Axis have maybe got to think about how many wins they want to secure. Like, like it, again, you, you keep the players as far away from this as possible because uh, it really adds a lot of stress. But in the back room, they'll be discussing, hey, how many wins do we need to get into the upper bracket? Or are we going to take the lower bracket? We want more games maybe um, to sort of flesh out the strategy we want to take forward. So you can take that design approach and you want to think about detonation focus me like very close in the standings how much does a loss affect them does that further increase our chances of getting through do we play this game the way we know or do we continue our learning uh, especially for stuff like the zigs away from the jinx things that can't be taken away from them as easily do we continue that learning against now a stricter uh, opponent and maybe uh, we'll see it go either way I personally uh, have to take the safe wins. When you're in playoffs, you can just get more scrims, get the Ws on the board. Uh, you've, you know, you've you've had your learning against Sengoku. It's valuable, even though it's a loss. Maybe don't give DFM the extra points if you can I avoid mean, it. If you can avoid it. I, I, if you can avoid it, that's the thing. Um, because I do feel like this matchup could start to look a little bit difficult perhaps for Axis. I, I'm looking in particular towards the top half of the map and we sort of compare the trajectory of top laners and that's a matchup I'm going to throw on you initialize to hear your feedback on but Ebi versus Inno. It feels like Ebi has been playing very well as of late whereas Inno kind of on that downward trend and perhaps this puts more emphasis on the fact that Axis should go back on a much more bot hyper carry focus. Do you feel like this top lane is going to be an area of attack for DFM in this upcoming match? This is a weird one because DFM, <laughs> with the roster, can play through any lane. That said, this is Ebby and 